Hello and welcome to yet another Lord Slart panel discussion, where today we are watching an episode of the Chibnall era, episode 3 of Flux, Once Upon Time. And as Doctor Who fans, we all know that every episode that has time in the title is either really good or shit. So it's going to be an interesting discussion to have here. And so I have three guests today. Everybody turned up. I mean, let's do a fucking can-can. This is the first time we've had everybody turn up um, to the panel discussion this series. We have a regular fixture of the Lord Slaw. Lord Slaw? <laughs> uh, Lord Slaw YouTube channel, Joey. Get fluxed. <laughs> yeah, you've been saving that one. And I also have two... Two Lord Slard debutants with Jude, or oh, also known Hello. as Pig and Tea Break. Is that, is that your handle? Also to, it is, yeah, Pig and Tea Break. It's a little peep show reference. Yeah, I, 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 did, I did get the peep show reference, and I am, I'm pleased about it. Lovely. A nice. A hug country. and a mug. A hug and a mug. A wank exactly. and a packet. Right, and also we have Ham Fisted Bum Vendor. Um, that, I mean, that's his handle on Twitter. Uh, his actual name is Corey. Hello there. Is that is that your channel's name as well? Um, I'm from uh, Time of the Hoovians United. Um, if I was to create a YouTube channel again, uh, that would probably be what I'd call it. But uh, maybe not, because we've just discovered some people have mistakenly misnamed the the, the iconic Pertwee quote. So <laughs> some people misunderstand. Uh, I thought it was Hamfisted Bum Vendor. So it's it's Hamfisted Bum Vendor. <laughs> <laughs> that was the iconic poetry line from Tell of the Autons. That's uh, where it came from. I, I just I have a that. filthy mind. I will turn anything into something disgusting. <laughs> but yeah, go check out Time of the Hoovians United um, because I actually have an appearance on there in the Season 10 review. Uh, so that might be a good place to start as a Lord Slar fan venturing into a new channel. So, we are going to start off by discussing the Doctor, Jodie Whittaker, the 13th Doctor, in this story and i think um in this kind of section discussion we'll also just throw in the fugitive doctor considering judy whittaker basically played that role would you like to start us off jude uh yeah i thought i thought jody was really good in this one um i think I, I mean my opinion from from series 13 in general is that her performance is uh, definitely improved i think she's definitely sort of warmed into the role a lot um and i think there was a, a sort of notable change in performance when she was playing the uh, fugitive doctor um, which I thought was really strong, and it you know it came across as, as showing her range pretty pretty well. I think. Yeah, I must agree that I found the Thirteenth Doctor much more tolerable this series. I'm I'm still not a fan of hers, but a lot of the more kind of embarrassing and cringy moments do seem to have been cut out, both in the writing and with the acting. There was still a few more of them in this episode than there was in the last one because I really praised Jodie in the last one for actually being one of the times I thought she really capture the Doctor. Yeah. But, you know, overall, not really a performance to complain about. Um, although we'll get onto the yeah. Fugitive Doctor stuff in a minute. I really did enjoy her in, um, in War of the Santarans, but I did find myself thinking when she was doing the Fugitive scenes, I kept thinking, wow, could we just have been giving Joe Martin dialogue to yes. the entire time? <laughs> it's actually really damn good dialogue, and she plays it really well. I found myself really enjoying the dialogue in those scenes. But one thing that really annoyed about those scenes is I just desperately wanted joe martin to be the doctor yeah. in that moment oh my god I really, I, really, I really do wish i really do wish that joe martin got to do like a whole like complete scene in one of those like at least for like a solid minute or two they literally to, like, gave see. us the fugitive doctor and wouldn't yeah. even let joe martin play her yeah <laughs> it's so annoying because it's like when else are we feasibly gonna see this doctor i mean Maybe Russell T. Davis will do something with it. Personally, I don't think so. I think he's going to move on from all of Chibnall's lore and do his own go. thing. So it's yeah, like, this is one of the last chances. This is one of the last chances to really see the future of jo Doctor. And we're kind of deprived of that just to see Jodie do um, what, what I would describe as a pale imitation of Joe Martin, who really, really gets that character right just straight out the gate. Barely had you know, 20 minutes yeah. screen time in the role. And I just completely yeah, buy she's the Doctor. It's a little, the little bit... Yeah, like the little bit that she was in in this episode, like I, I just I, I found myself like falling in love with her all over again because she is just so effortlessly the doctor. I think she's if I'm so honest, damn good. With Joe Martin, I think of all the actors that have played the doctor, like ever, 
Uh, she's probably won me over the quickest. Like from the get go, she was in the role. If that makes sense, like she was just in it straight away and just could play the role so well. I think it's almost been a mistake yeah. bringing her in because for me, it's really shown just how much, at least for me, the 30th Doctor just doesn't work as the Doctor at all. And honestly, I don't think Jodie Whittaker was right for the role in the end because she's still really struggling to convince me that this is the Doctor free series. And there's been a couple episodes here and there, like Haunting and War of the Sometimes, but like, okay, yeah, this is the Doctor. But Joe Martin, as you say, just did it straight away. Well, no, I, th I mean, I, I sort of disagree. I do like I do like Jodie quite a bit. Um, I think she's definitely very different to Joe Martin, uh, very markedly different. Um, but no, I do know. I do know what you mean. I think. I think Joe Martin sort of naturally took took to the role. My, I my find, take uh, is that she, she did she did quite well on it on the woman fell to earth. Like that that night, I thought she she nailed it quite well. It was then from then on is is when that kind of personality changed a bit far from what we was introduced with. Um, and then we, we were slowly kind of getting back to some of those bits, in, in my opinion, that we saw on the first night. Like that character is kind of starting to become more more reined in because she's she's very happy and joyous and very happy-go-lucky. But like now she's starting to be a bit more focused and concentrated, a bit more, you know, doctory. So I agree with that. Come in, maybe. I will. I will say also, like, on her performance from this episode, um, of course, you know, I, I don't think she was, like, as overshadowed as much as she was in, in like, Fugitive of the Jadoon, um, because she did, uh, Jodie did turn in quite, uh, quite a good performance, I think, especially towards the end. Um, everything from, like, her last, like, couple, like, pleading with the Maury scenes towards the end, like, Jodie, like, really nailed those last couple moments, and um, I found myself really enjoying her performance. And of course, Joe Martin is brilliant, but I mean, I, 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 I did think like Jodie was actually like more on her level in this episode as compared to Fugitive. Yeah, I'd say so. I think that Jodie has gotten better, but I still don't personally think that, well, you know, three series in, you should have already long since nailed the role if you were right for it. And she definitely hasn't been helped by the writing, but I don't know, like... I'm I'm still I'm still not really convinced, and it's nothing to do with you know it being a woman cast as Doctor because obviously Joe Martin instantly convinced me of that. So yeah, no, I, I get you. I think I think yeah, the um, there is there is a big difference in quality. I do I think Joe Martin does a, does a better job of of portraying the character um, than Jodie does, just in my opinion. Um, I I would have preferred to see Joe Martin on screen more in this episode and also throughout the whole series. But you know, I do like Jodie as well. I I think they're just very very different different roles or di or different portrayals at least. And honestly, after yeah. this kind of getting basically cock teased with Joe Martin's Doctor, I'm going to be very yeah. angry if she's not in properly in another episode of this series. I think she I think probably she will be. be. No, like, I mean, yeah. they, 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 released, they released that one behind the scenes clip today where like Joe Martin basically does say, oh, it's like, oh yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be back. But like, without actually saying yeah. that she'll be back. But, yeah. I think Jodie Whittaker feels a lot like the, the Peter Davison of the modern era. I don't know if that makes any sense. No, no, I, no, it does. I was actually thinking about this earlier. One of the things yeah. I dislike really most about uh, Jodie Whittaker's Doctor is how unconfident she is a lot of the time what i love about the doctor's character is just how confident and brash they are at least in a lot of incarnations and jodie isn't that she's always second guessing herself and i don't enjoy that and peter davison is my least favorite classic doctor and he's also very much like that especially yeah, early on in the zero yeah also, I see we did get a bit more bite we did get a bit more bite towards the end of this episode like when she started like snapping it yeah towards the end i really did enjoy those couple scenes um we started getting like, getting, like pissy at Yaz towards the end of the episode, and I found myself really enjoying those moments. Yeah, it's much better than the kind of yeah. mindless adoration she had for the the fam. Like, yeah. you know, yeah, definitely. <laughs> it's much yeah. more entertaining to actually have some drama rather than all these people love each other very much and they never have any problems with each other ever, and they're all great and all lovely. It's like <laughs> the first yeah. time there was any character conflict was literally Revolution of the Daleks, I believe, between like yeah. those characters. Yeah, yeah. They're yeah. going to have a massive falling out soon, I bet. It's, it's coming, into it? Yeah, it's coming. it is building towards that. And thank oh. God. <laughs> like, the character drama has been so yeah, flat so, so far. Please. Yeah, give me something. Which, when you think about yeah. it, actually, that's like the opposite direction of what, what some people want. Like, people want Phasmin. But that's slowly not becoming a reality because they're, they're going to fall out. 
Well, can I can I buy Tokenary Phasmin Rand? Like people were wanting this before anything had aired, and they they have no like um, chemistry together whatsoever. The characters were clearly never intended to be that. This is just people projecting their own fantasies onto the show, which is fine. You're allowed to yeah. do that, but you can't expect Chris Chibnall to like bend to this whim that you've had that clearly has no basis in the writing. I'm sort of on the fence with the whole Phasmin thing because I'm I'm not a huge fan of the Doctor being romantic with any sort of human. Yeah, I agree. Also, yeah. with with the precedent of having um, basically every modern Doctor aside from Capaldi be romantic, I think maybe there should be some representation. But in, in that sort but of Jodie's Doctor is very clearly portrayed as asexual. She's shown absolutely no kind of romantic interest whatsoever. Yeah, that is true. I I don't I don't Did, get. Didn't they... In this episode, though, didn't, didn't they give, give give like a little like Thasmin prick tease uh, at, the, at the one line when um when uh when the when Yaz's one friend is playing the video game and uh, that's her sister and she said yeah she, oh is that her sister oh, that was her yeah, sister yeah, what was that yeah no uh, uh, Yaz, Yaz wasn't playing Call of Duty to try and impress the doctor <laughs> no 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 because no, there was the one line where um. Uh, where she says like uh like who that sexy girl playing playing the video game and and yes like no one is ever gonna look at you and think that and then she turns into the doctor. <laughs> oh yeah yeah. The, that's oh, yeah, that's yeah. a stretch. That's a massive stretch. No no no. no, no, no. I, I, I... I know it's a stretch, but people are gonna take that as, as like context for thousands. Well, it's because people are desperate for it, even though there's like I, I don't know why they're so desperate for it. There's no basis for this in the show. It's just silly. Yeah. Anyway, this is getting um, wildly right. off topic now, so yeah, we're going to move on. A rap. Yeah. <laughs> it's fine. It was good content. We're going to move on. We're going to go on and talk about the companions in this episode, and I'm also going to include Vinda in the companions because for some reason the show seems really against calling him a companion. But I mean, you know, recurring friend of the Doctor who has now travelled in the TARDIS. He's a companion. Buddy. Yeah, like. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, Corey, do you want to start this one? Yeah, why not? Yeah, um, I'd say Vinda probably is more uh, the standout, like companion of them all, because he got more attention and focus because we know the least about him. So it was obviously uh, the right time to give a bit more of a backstory to him. I'm not gonna lie, his backstory is not quite what I was expecting because when he said like. You know, he did something bad, which is why he's been put on the outpost as kind of like to repent what he did. I wasn't really expecting it to be he grasped upon his boss for his like unlawful doings. And that's why he's being silenced to be put on the on the ship. So he doesn't, you know, uh, speak out about uh, what happened. But I, I do like uh, I do like Vinder. I think it's quite a cool character. We, we've not seen too much of him just yet, but I just get a, a generally cool vibe about him. My favourite's got to be Dan. Like even if Dan, Dan is brilliant, clueless, even if Dan's clueless, oh. no, it's literally Dan's not even Dan. Dan's just John Bishop being John. Bishop. Yeah, like, it, it's it's exactly the same as when Bradley Walsh came on the show. He just played no, Bradley Walsh. Like, it's just, no matter it, what, it's just does, generally it's charming. Yeah. It's just fun. It's just fun. You know, you, you just have fun watching him do what he does, even if it, even if it's just nothing or just completely being an idiot, you know. And then Yaz. Yaz didn't get much of a focus really that much like apart from like obviously the the weeping angel is obsessed with us somehow and that's going to come back later on um, and obviously something's wrong with a time stream and then that little bit of conflict towards the end with the doctor obviously we said before they're going to have a falling out soon so there's it's nice to see a bit of conflict between those two because I think like one of the first things Jodie said to um, to Yaz was we're friends now aren't we we're friends which, you know, it's, it's come a long way now where actually they're not getting along as well as they used to. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, I'd say, yeah, Dan, definitely good. Yaz, fine. Vinda's quite cool, to be fair. Um, one question I want to ask you quickly is go back to what you said about about Vinda is I don't remember the line of dialogue that you said in the previous episode about doing something bad. Can you give me a refresher on that? Is. I'm sure he said something. I'm sure he yeah, did. Yeah, it was when he was in the outpost. He was talking about how, um, you know, he's doing that sort of... Um, recording himself yeah uh, I, i'm assuming that he was going to send to uh bell he was talking about how he's been posted and that you know he hates the people who've put him there so i, I think i think it might have been mentioned then i'm i'm, I'm gonna be honest i don't i don't think i remember it 
Maybe he just thought it was an easy way of explaining it to her. I don't know. Um, that that if if that's the case, I don't remember it. But yeah, maybe that is a bit of an oversight in terms of dialogue because you think he'd be righteously indignant because <laughs> what he was doing yeah, the right yeah, thing for sure. But anyway, Joey, sorry I interrupted you because I was desperate to ask that question. No, 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 so you go on. No, no, oh no, I, 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 I'm pretty much staying on topic too. Um, I enjoyed Binder a lot more than I thought I would actually. Um, I mentioned this on Twitter. I, I think like the whole episode is a great exercise in in giving our characters backstories yeah. without it feeling like it's like without, without it just feeling like you're. It wasn't exposition. Another timeless children. Yeah, it, it really wasn't. Like it was a really cool idea and a really great way of of getting us to know each of our characters. Um, it, it easily could have been another timeless children where we just like PowerPoint presentation. This is this character's backstory. This is what happened to Dan. Um, but they didn't do that, and, and and they actually like showed us what happened in a really new and interesting way. And I really enjoyed the way they went about it. The only part of it that I think did kind of detract from it because it wasn't in the same vein as the rest of the episode were the bell segments. Um, they didn't really fall in line with that same sort of. Uh, jumping through time and and getting our characters backstories that way. I, mean, I, I still enjoyed her. You know, the actress playing her gave a fun performance, and I, I'm into, into seeing where the character is going. But I really enjoyed Vinder a lot more than I thought. I liked his flashbacks. Uh, Dan's flashbacks were great. Yaz is Yaz. <laughs> I really don't know what to say about Yaz anymore. It's, she's just well. I, 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 I have some stuff to say about that kind of stuff because. I felt I agree with you in the way that it was kind of a clever way in kind of getting to know these characters a bit more. And, you know, I thought that was a good feature of the episode, but there were good bits and bad bits. So I thought Vinda's stuff was really good. We definitely needed to get to know him. Now I feel like I do. I know a bit more about this character. Like I can begin to care about him. That was all good. Um, the Doctor's stuff was really good. I feel it was important to reveal a bit more about um, the Fugitive Doctor and the... A, a, a tiny bit about kind of the division and swarms past that that stuff was all really good but i didn't feel that dan and yaz's segments really added anything they went on for a long time but pretty much kept on doing the same things it was like ooh, here is a normal interaction in their history oh no the doctor's here and now they're somewhere else and it was just like that scene I was do. perhaps repeated a too many times with them and we didn't really learn anything new about them like that was basically just having the same com awkward conversations we'd seen him have with uh this diane character in the first episode so we already know this about them and their relationship it didn't really get developed much further at all especially given the amount of screen time that he had and then yeah yaz didn't really go anywhere either apart from really like i mean this is probably a hot take but honestly the weeping angels just aren't scary for me anymore um, it's not that I've grown up, it's just they've been overused. Because I, 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 I felt this in the Muffat era. And just being used like this so frivolously, I don't know, it kind of takes away from it. There's no kind of psychological horror element because there's no build-up. It's just like, oh my god, a jump scare, rather than like slowly and creepily building it up like in the first two Angels episodes. So that's what made them so scary. And they're still scary to this day, by the way. Not going to lie, to be fair, my reaction was not, oh, ah, it's, oh, cool. Oh, they, they look, you know, sort of like, yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't know I wasn't, why. Yeah, I, I, I don't I, think I the angels... The because, I kind of have the same thing because, because I agree, like, the, the angels just aren't scary anymore, but I, I thought it was, like, a really interesting way to use them. It, it was definitely different, and they took that same idea from Time of Angels with the image of an angel becomes itself an angel. They took that concept... Uh, and I still don't like angel. that concept. I think that's dumb still. I mean, I like Time of the Angels, Flesh and Stone, but that was the dumbest bit from it. It's a weird concept because... So this is what I've been thinking about today with the whole, the image of an angel. So in Time of Angels, Flesh and Stone, there's no pictures in the book. There's not even any drawings. So that would insinuate that even a drawing can become an angel. But then you go, okay, well, if a drawing be can become an angel, if I just drew a weeping angel, would it just spawn an angel out of yeah. like, where would that Where would that angel come from? Um, yeah. are, they, are they some omnipotent being that monitors every single <laughs> drawing in the world just in case it's it somewhat resembles an angel so it can come through? I know, like, I, it, it's just... Bless. That that bit of lore was only added by Muffet because I think, ooh, how can I make the angels even scarier? I know, this it's could happen to you in your sense. living room. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. And it's just like, well, yeah, but it doesn't actually make sense. So this actually makes them less scary rather than more scary. But okay, you, you do you, Muffet. Yeah. Yeah, it has to be specifically a weeping angel, like a picture of said weeping angel, rather than a angel that looks like a weeping angel. 
I honestly have no clue. I, I don't. I don't know if the rules are very specific. I think it's just if it looks a bit like a statue with wings, you're screwed. Perhaps. Don't yeah. do that. Then. <laughs> yeah. It, it's a. It's one of those throwaway bits of dialogue about a recurring Doctor Who monster that you'd do well to discard. Like, you know, there's plenty of stupid bits of lore that have been picked up over the years with re these recurring monsters, but most oh, of the time they remember to forget them, um, you know, conveniently yeah. next episode, so we don't have to worry about it, but no. <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. Anyway, uh, we got anything there's else? There's a few bits of that in the Moffat era. Have we got anything else to um, talk about uh, about the companions before we move on to talk more generally about the plot? Yeah. It's about, uh, about Bell again. I know it's more to do with the story, but it's, I found it a bit strange how they kind of opened with Bell's story from like the previously. Like they built up the previously with the tension and then cut to Bell's story rather than resolving the cliffhanger straight away. I thought it was a bit weird. Like they gave Bell more focus on the actual resolution of the cliffhanger. Well, I, I think the, what, seeing, as, seeing as the resolution of the cliffhanger was pretty much the entire plot of the episode. Actually, can I just have a mini rant about that? It was kind of bullshit, the resolution of the cliffhanger, because we had Jodie Whittaker being right next to Swarm as he clicked his fingers. But yet, in the resolution, he hasn't clicked his fingers yet, and she's ages away doing some other bullshit. Yeah, yeah still, but I feel like it, it built up a lot of tension, and it kind of cut to Bell. I was like, oh, why did you do that for? That was a bit weird. Like... Well, 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 I, felt better. I don't know. Well, let's move I, on to the plot know. now, as I do have a bit to say about Bell as well. Yeah. Yeah, so my kind of complaint about Bell is, I don't know, I didn't find these scenes particularly necessary. I don't really know what we learned that was important. And I think it, it was, if anything, it was just confusing. I mean, this is already a very big plot with a ton of threads. Um, and now, all of a sudden, Flux has happened off screen? Or has it? I'm still not sure. Has Flux happened? Has it not? Has it happened in this far future? I mean, I'm assuming they're humans, these far for these far future humans, or is it for modern day Earth when it was coming for earlier? And it's just like it just kind of dumped it on us and it's like I don't really know what the flux is or sort of what it's doing. Yeah. Or, or, I mean I guess that's sort of the point, but it just feels like it it was a threat in the first episode and the earth had to be protected. And then it it, it was this is the weird thing it was shown to destroy entire planets and, and just turn them to dust but then Vinda's planet had been hit by the flux but it was sort of still intact yeah they said, that the universe was a mess. Weird. They said it was a yeah. mess out them so because i was thinking right if it's such a bad thing like all these episodes they're more concerned about other events like if if the flux is so important why are they focusing on other things like surely if the if the universe is ending like imminently why are we focusing on other things? I don't know. It just kind of felt like it It must have only had that sort of impact in that moment. And then after that, well, so far, we've not really seen the impact too much, have we, really? But it's like, it just kind of... It, 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 I'm not even sure where this scene is meant to be taking place in the sequence of events, because like, I was under the impression that the flux hadn't really fully happened yet. No. Yet now it has happened. And but it's happened off screen mostly. But but, but is, is it but is it over or is it still like going yeah. through the universe? Like I'm not really clear on that. Like I mean but I know people are gonna say that it's like people are gonna say that you know oh well, it's a six part so they can explain things. But I think when you dedicate so much of the episode to this stuff in the aftermath of the flux, you need to explain it there. Otherwise, the audience is just gonna turn around and go what? What are you talking I about? Is is the flux the main like? Is the flux the main like cause of worry? Because obviously, they because like Swarm and Azure was wanting to destroy time. Well, they were trying to do that th whatever they were doing in in, in, in Atropos. Like what Thirteen did clearly had a big effect to allow their plan to continue. So what? what where does flux come into all of this? It's like flux has happened, but they're also doing something else that's gonna be even as big maybe I, I don't know because from like today that that blue stuff that dis that destroys people that's the only thing that's kind of like came from it i don't know if i don't know what sort of impact flux kind of has I, mean, the opening. Yeah. I think um but, and, and needs to remember 
Should at least remember that one of the benefits of having a six-part story is you don't need to fit every episode in the neat little boxes. You can kind of overrun and overlap into different episodes if something needs to be explained there and then. Anyway, sorry, Joey, I've interrupted you twice now, so I'll let you go off. <laughs> Oh, no, no, you're all you're all good. Um, but uh, but on that topic, um, of, uh, like bleeding other episodes into each other, they did kind of do that in War of the Santars in the, in the setting up of, of, of time and all that. But uh, but what was I gonna say? Oh yeah, they did introduce that one weird idea in uh, in in like the second the second of the main like fugitive flashbacks where they said that the Doctor is the reason the Flux was created, and I'm not quite it sure how I feel about sort that of, um, going. Pandora opens vibes where it was a a threat uh, the Doctor saw. <laughs> And it turns out, hey, it was made for you. And they're like, oh, no, I'm bad. Yeah, you are, mate. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, I'm, I'm, not really, I'm not really into that. Like, I didn't even... Wait, I didn't even realise that. When did that happen? <laughs> it was Towards when... The end, it, yeah, when the Doctor appears in that room with that with that mm -hmm. mysterious lady. Oh, she was yeah. Like, um, yeah, she was saying, oh, the flux... Yeah, it was made... I think I think it was then. She was like, it's made for you. She was like, it's, it's not yeah. a natural event. It was it was made. It was made because of, yeah, because of you or something. I, I think an issue is Chibnall's trying to make us juggle too many unresolved plot threads at once. Like, you're allowed to introduce a lot of plot threads in a long six-part story like this, but you do need to kind of systematically answer them because if there's too many things going on at once... It's all just feels a bit too much for a viewer. Like, you know, it, I mean, this, this episode, I did enjoy it, but man, what kind of casual fat is going to be able to watch this? Oh, yeah. I, I, think, every, I think every casual viewer of, of modern Doctor Who is just going to switch off after this one. I mean, no <laughs> most of them watch. already had, like, during the gym leader, but this is a <laughs> woo, <laughs> death knell for a lot of them. Oh, yeah. And it wasn't even a bad episode, but it was just like, you know, just pace, oh, yeah, pace like, things out a bit, Chibnall. You have six hours. Yeah, if, if you weren't obligated as a longtime fan of Doctor Who to keep uh, keep up on this show, I think most people would switch off after this episode. Mm. Anyway, anything more to say on the plot before we uh, move on? Um, no, I think, I think I've oh, seen... Oh, wait, actually, I did, I did like the one thing, um, the, uh, because I saw a fan theory of it couple like like a week or two ago uh, even after the oh yeah whenever one more of the santarn santarn there um and i like that it actually came true uh diane being in passenger I actually really like that idea uh, yeah that was yeah. billy garrett john i think who um who said that yep. you say that okay i wasn't sure who said it yeah um very cool idea I really like that they followed through with that yeah that was a yeah, cool that idea was cool right so now yeah. we're going to move on to talking about the production quickly of the story. So that's anything like not to do with the writing or acting, just purely yeah. how it looks, how it's directed, how it sounds. And I think that's been the category which has been broadly positive throughout the Chibnall era, although I feel there may be a few criticisms here, at least from my perspective. Would you like to start, Joey? The CGI Daleks. The CGI Daleks, we love them. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, CGI Daleks in the beginning looks shit. Um, I wasn't into the look of the um, of those sequences uh, where the doctor was talking to the Mori, I think a lot of it looked. I mean, like obviously it's it's fake, but it, but it looks very obviously fake. I should say some of the um, division stuff had like some very bad like... green screen, at least by modern standards. Yeah, I'm like I'm not going to yeah, knock them on it too much because I think a lot of it was due to COVID um, and lockdowns yeah. and things like that. Yeah, but I still think those CGI Daleks are inexcusable because the CGI Dalek that levitates in 2005's Dalek well, they, looked I mean, better. They must have... <laughs> I mean, they must have a they must have a they must have a million Dalek props. Like they could have gotten some out of storage and just had them roll by quick. You know? I think <laughs> it was the case of, um, yeah, if it was COVID, then they wouldn't have been able to do that. And also, animating them rolling on the floor, they would have had to like animate the dirt moving and all that sort of stuff. And it, I don't think it would have been worth it for like. But a you could, second, but, but you could have had it better and had them levitate because the two thousand and five Dalek levitating looks better than the CGI yeah. Daleks now. And we're sixteen years ahead yeah. in technology now. Like you can pretty cheaply make a very realistic looking CGI Dalek at this point. Or just yeah. don't show the Daleks at all. Oh yeah, they were, completely, they were completely unnecessary. I feel like that's our Terry Nation contract this year. That's their <laughs> <Yeah>. Terry. <laughs> I, I, but yeah. People seem to be saying that that Terry Nation contract thing isn't even true. Like, there's no evidence for oh, it. It's, it's so true. Every single year there's a Dalek appearance. 
Yeah, yeah, but I think yeah, but that could just be the BBC saying that you must have a Dalek appearance because Daleks yeah, boost viewers. Because, just because they happen to have, just because Daleks happen to appear quite a lot, uh, it might just be the fact that Daleks are popular, and if you stick them on the front of the Radio Times or any other promotional material, it'll make it'll make people watch. Yeah. Yeah, you got to remember that the people running the BBC at the moment have absolutely zero artistic integrity, and it's all just about I mean, what will get the most views. Integrity in general. <laughs> no, they're, yeah, exactly. <laughs> they're publishing like the most transphobic and horrible articles. They have no integrity. Oh, don't, well. don't, don't even get me started on that article. We could be here forever. But this is uh, this <laughs> the channel about Doctor Who. Anything else to say about? Uh, I know what you mean. Yeah. Uh, is there anything else the to say about oh, the music? Uh, I mean, oh, second act. Yeah, second yeah, act is fine video. as usual. Music is good. Yeah, I've I've been a fan. Of, I've been obviously I'm I'm, a, I'm more of a fan of Murray Gold, but I do like bits of uh, Seagull's music. Like there are a few pieces over the year that I've I've liked. Like I'm not like I'm not like them all. There's been a handful, but I think like this series is where he's kind of picking up more, and his music's being a bit more noticeable and, and a bit more um, unique and, and distinct. But, and I am actually really really enjoying it. In terms of like some Taran theme and, and, and like the swarm theme, and you know, I think they're getting better. I do think the themes are getting better in terms of music. Yeah, well, see, I I don't I don't like a lot of the time. There's two. I sometimes I think that especially with Murray Gold, there was an over reliance on all these themes and motifs. Whereas I kind of prefer it when the music's there to enhance the atmosphere, rather than be some kind of big signifier of what's going on in the story. If you get what I mean. Murray Gold tend music. Like it was good, but it tend to feel it's it sort of tend to feel like it was, it was saying, overbearing. This is how you must this is how you mm. must feel now. Yes. You know, um, which I wasn't a huge uh, fan of, I must say. So because of that, like like I I, I, I would gladly take Akinola for the oh, second RTD me too. era. Me I, too. I, I know I know he won't, but like Oh I'd I'd love he won't. I'd love to see the RTD era scored in a way that's not overbearing and you know Oh that'd be so, a, oh, a, yeah, subtle, be so... a subtle score. Because I think it would fit it would fit RTD's new writing style, but, you know, this isn't about RTD. Hey, either. all I'm saying, synth is popular again. Let's get some synthy, oh, yeah. some synthy, horrible, cheesy, shite schlock music in there. Looking forward to it. Our is popular again. Oh, by the way, Arc me saying it's synthy, shite schlock is actually a problem because I like it. Yeah, fair enough. I just like old track, man. Anyway, so let's move on to our final thoughts about this episode. Would you like to kick us off, Jude? Um, final thoughts. I mean, in general, uh, I, I, I had an enjoyable time watching it. It wasn't massively hard to follow, which is the criticism that I've seen. Um, it was one of those episodes where I could sort of sit back, not take it too seriously, and have a good time. Um, there were some sort of, you know, dud moments, like the Daleks um, but I think visually it was quite stunning uh, Jody gave a decent performance Joe Martin gave a brilliant performance um, and it was interesting to sort of see where the story's going the only sort of criticism I have is that it did feel like it um, was sort of holding back on, on some detail um, I did feel a bit lost a few times sort of not knowing where a scene was going that um, that whole scene of the of the chap in the, in the tunnels um, who just sort of Ran away with the gun and then didn't come back was just really oh, strange. Yeah. What, what, he's what dropping is, up. Who the hell? What is he? What, what the fuck is with him? I think he's called like Joseph Williamson. He's he's kind of featured. He's it, a real person. He created the Williamson tunnels. But I'm I am also intrigued to figure out where he fits in because after next week we've got like the one before the finale slash part one of the finale. So mm. where does he fit in? Well, that's the thing because he appeared last episode and first just said hi to Yaz and then was a bit rude to her and then just ran away. And now he's in this episode. He was a bit rude to Dan and then he ran away. I mean, <laughs> next episode is he gonna be like rude to rude to Vinda or the Doctor and then run away? Yeah, next Maybe weekend he's gonna <laughs> steal like some sweets off a child. Then he's gonna knock an old lady over on the road and you know, just very petty villainy. He's gonna, um, he's gonna be. He's going to be rude to uh, rude to the flux, and that's how the flux is going to be defeated. He's going to fart near the queen right like Joe Biden. Yeah, that's what's <laughs> going to happen. <laughs> uh, anyway, Corey, um, do you want to go next? Well, yeah, this, is, this was like a, a tale of two halves because, like, yeah, last night I came out thinking, I don't know what to think. 
Like, a lot went up. I understood it. I, I knew exactly what was going off. But I kind of felt like, what? What? I don't know how, how to feel last night. But after seeing it, seeing it again today, definitely enjoyed it a lot more. Now, what is what it, what I enjoyed the most is it's giving us answers for, like, the division. Because I'm here for the division. It, it's quite a cool concept. And obviously, they've now set it up with, I know, the time of child's not the biggest, you know, most, you know, like, favoured plot in the whole entire world. But... I quite like the, the uh, division, and they're starting to answer questions. They're starting to delve into that and go down that sort of route. So it gave a few more, you know, a bit of backstory on that, which, which was really cool. Um, so yeah, I think overall not quite enjoyable. Gave us a lot, a lot of answers, um, a, a bit of uh, stuff for Vinda, which, which was cool. And it, I'm not sure where it's placed. It's not the best one because my favourite is War of the Centaurans, but I think overall pretty decent. Yeah, I'd, I'd say it probably it's probably the weakest out of the three. I still oh it. no, it's, it's far better than Halloween Apocalypse. Is that like... definitely? Come on, I, I think I think I like I think I like Santarans more, but this was definitely better than, than Halloween Apocalypse. I it's quite good. enjoyed I quite enjoyed. The I first was first, fifty I minutes of jangling Ooh. keys, man. Nothing to it. The <laughs> like worst it. way of was, doing setup possible. Right. Uh, anyway, yeah, Joey, do you want to go? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, I rather enjoyed this episode. Uh, one of Jodie Whittaker's uh, be best performances in the era so far. Joey, Mo jo the, Joey, <laughs> Joe Martin's always lovely to see. Wait, is that uh, something you're not telling us, best. Joey? <laughs> is that your alter ego? <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, I, I turn into Joe Martin <laughs> whenever they need her. Um, no. <laughs> I hope it's not blackface. Uh, but no, John. John oh no, god uh, anyway john bishop remains one of the best things about this series yaz is yaz um great to get some backstory on vinder uh a character that i really was not interested at all going in and came out really enjoying and uh, i'm excited to see where he goes swarm and Azur remain some of the most interesting new who villains ever so far I, i'm really i'm really finding myself enjoying them and um, i think that about does it uh also also as someone who like really wasn't into any timeless child stuff before this, uh, the fact that they just like straight up gave me timeless child scenes and I found myself actually really invested in it is is a really a testament to just it wasn't necessarily what was being shown to me in the timeless children that was the issue; it was how it was being done, and uh, and I think I'm actually uh, finding myself more invested in the art going forward at this point. So, well, anyway, uh, don't I, need, don't need to worry about getting invested because RTD is going to throw it in the bin. Or at least ignore it. That's true. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> anyway, yes. Yeah, so I thought this was this was an enjoyable episode. Like I thought it was a, a clever way of kind of giving us a bit more information about both the characters and advancing the plot a little, while you know, also not you know marching off too far. Because bear in mind, we still got half of the story to go yet. There were some problems. There was uh, obviously I, I thought that Dan's and Yaz's seed didn't really go anywhere. I felt that the inclusion of Bell's story was not only unnecessary but very confusing um so it did have its um fair share of issues but overall not a bad episode of doctor who by any stretch um although i do feel that this is one that could get retroactively worse if the rest of the story doesn't properly take all of the plot threads forward because then this will just be kind of seen as a waste that's of episode that's certainly yeah that's but awesome. my current opinion is that it was all right it had its problems but it also had some good things about it, so, you know, I'm not going to complain too much. So, I would like to thank very much my free guest today. Good to be here. Yeah, uh, yeah. Fuck off. <laughs> All right, and, and with that, we're ending it. So, bye. <laughs>